Did you know you were going to get out on Christmas Day? Did you know you were wearing them thin? Or? Well, they were, they were doing, doing little uh, magical tricks with, with my sentencing. Uh, and the last one that they did was they said that we didn't work on Sundays, so all of my Sundays wouldn't count. So they added those up and stuck them on the end. So I wasn't aware of um, the, how long it was actually going to be uh, for most of the time I was there. Uh, I'm, this is my, the love of my life and the pacifist in, in our family. I am not Yeah, but a you're the one in the slam and uh, he's free. Uh, it's, it's, I'm not a pacifist. What's that, Justice? And, it, <clears throat> and the notion that we were going to cost Mississippi, uh, that we were going to require of Mississippi that they do what they know is legal and that we were going to flood their jails and uh, fill their dockets and break them financially until they did what they know they should have been doing. Uh, that's not a nonviolent attitude, but it was my attitude. And I, I saw, I, I was in the first cell on the cell block, so I saw all the comings and goings, and the whole thing started to have a kind of rhythm, a beat. You know, they came in and they went out. I listened to the chatter from the guards among themselves because I was right around the corner from where they, they were. And they joked, you know, yeah, here she comes, there she goes. And uh, I knew that CORE had processed some hundred and some uh, freedom riders through the court system that they had paid the bond, they had paid the court costs, they had paid everything. And then when they were found guilty a second time, they had paid the bond again and the court cost, and a hundred and some of these. And I knew they didn't need a hundred and some plus to take, take, the, take it to the Supreme Court. So um, I decided, and also seeing them, it started feeling like a supermarket kind of thing. And I felt that there, there, ought, to be, there ought to be some kind of small historical footnote that said uh, the state of Mississippi exacted this price for these children going in, <coughs> pardon me, into a, wait, a public waiting room and sitting down next to a fellow student. So <coughs> I, I refused to pay the bond. I refused to participate in their, their little kangaroo court thing they had going on. And uh, I cost them when they when they put us in the state penitentiary and then drained off the people who were there they were paying for a whole cell block for one person they were paying to feed me and to clothe me and they were paying to guard me and so I wasn't giving Mississippi any that's part of my non not nonviolence. Well, so. they were guarding you, in it, but it was part of your strategy. You weren't going to escape. No, no. <laughs> you were. <laughs> you were yes. You were resolved to but stay. But she had uh, to be paid to be there. Right, right. And uh, I was the only reason that she was there. You were so. in effect demanding the state. I recall that scene from the film Gandhi. You were demanding <laughs> of the system that it keep you in as long as it could. Yes, and they did. They they cooperated in that, <laughs> but. Um, so, like I said, I'm not the nonviolent uh, person in this partnership, but um, that those are the reasons I stayed. I think it's important for the audience, for all of us to remember, excuse me, all of us to remember exactly why you were put in, the two of you were jailed or put in the state penitentiary. It was not for high crime, well, at the time they probably were considered high crimes and misdemeanors, but they were a little vague. When Freedom Riders were arrested, they were charged with the breach of the peace. And when we went to court, I, I was arrested on May 28th. I went to court on May, morning of May 29th. And 
the lawyer, who was a, a Mississippian, a black Mississippian, one of only two lawyers in the state, black lawyers, was told by the judge that he could not mention race, he could not mention segregation, integration, name several words and terms he could not use, because this has nothing to do with that. It only has to do with the fact that these people came into our community and set up a situation that could have led to rioting and even death of innocent people. And uh, they contended that all the way through to the Supreme Court, that it had nothing to do with race. And the rioting didn't have to occur. Not one freedom writer out of there those was the four, possibility of. Out, out of the 400 and some freedom writers, not one committed a violent act during well, the Well, in, 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 in point of fact, basically you breach, you and the freedom writer, you breached the peace by driving in, riding in on a bus. Pretty much, your offense pretty much stopped there. It, that would be kind of like me parking my Cadillac downtown. Somebody steals it, so I'm guilty of car theft because I set up the situation mm -hmm. by parking my car where they could get to it. Yeah, Samantha, <laughs> does some of this strike you as, I mean, obviously you've done a lot of reading and you've been on the path, follow the path, but some of this I know will strike some American Arkansans of a certain age as absurd. It is almost, it's difficult to believe that this happened. And I'm, I just want to ask your thoughts on it because you, you have done more reading probably than the, than the average student. It is very shocking um, because to know that that was only 50 years ago, I mean, that's not that long ago that that was actually happening. And so um, I think going into it, the student freedom ride, I thought, um, you know, I knew segregation was, it happened, but I don't think I knew the extent of it. And one of the museums we went to, I can't remember the exact one, but there was a Coke machine and it was in like a waiting, a waiting room um, at, I guess, a bus station. And one side had, um, there were two sides of it, of the Coke machine. And one side was five cents and the other was 10 cents. The 10 cents was for the, um, the black waiting room and then the white waiting room was five cents. And so to me, even though that seems so trivial, it just really put things into perspective how extreme it was. I want to go back to the Myers for just a second and then back to you because here in the, in the civil rights or the, the Central High uh, National Historic Site and the wonderful exhibits behind us here, well, those exhibits make clear that there are still other frontiers that are being, even today. Um, we seem to be more willing, or are we, to confront them than we were a half century ago? Or, or are we? How much, how much have we progressed as a country? I think we've progressed a long way. I, I think I've known personally people who were quite racist in their thinking that have changed their thinking over the years quite a bit. But I still run into people who have not changed much. I work in a small place, 12 people work where I work, and at least three or four of them in the last year, I've heard say very racist things. Uh, one, some people were wanting a stoplight put up at an intersection that would interfere with her getting to work. And she said, that's mostly for the minorities that live in that housing unit. Every time they cry, the government comes to their aid, and I don't like it. And that's a very racist thing to say. I just, and one, one had an automobile accident, or a near accident, and he said, she was the dumbest driver I've ever seen. But she had a rattlesnake on her license plate. I guess that's self-explanatory. The rattlesnake is the emblem of Florida A&M University, a black school. And that was, he was saying she was black, so she must be dumb. Back to Samantha, if I can. The, the, do you see in your generation, the young folks who are in college now, as they were in college a half century ago, that, do, do you see that level of engagement? There are other battles to be fought as these exhibits uh, suggest. I, not really. Okay. I think that people, I think the problems today facing my generation are a lot more subtle. You know, segregation is very obvious, you know, that is wrong. It was obvious to, you know, this, the younger generation. But there are so many just little subtle things that you don't really know how to attack head on. And so I think a lot of young people get really discouraged. They don't know how to do anything about it. And so they just say, we'll let my parents do it. We'll let somebody else do it. And I think the Freedom Riders show that 
with, you know, we have no excuse not to do anything about it. We have Twitter, we have Facebook, we have MySpace, we have all these ways to mobilize and really do something. And so, you know, when somebody says to me, oh, we can't do anything about that, I want to get them on the phone with the Freedom Riders and make them tell them that because, you know, we really can do something if we just pull together and, and focus our efforts. There's a thought. I mean, uh, you, this generation, I guess, is using social media as, in a way, they, they are the buses of, of a half century ago. Uh, or, or is that just totally off base? At, no. at, but at the same time, it still is going to require human beings going out and yes, well, asserting, being assertive. Uh, it's a wonderful tool. It's, it's amazing with amazing possibilities. Uh, when we were young, it was a simpler time and we were fed, our souls were fed on innocence and joy and boundless possibility. And we had statesmen and leaders and dreamers and heroes we had we had the, a president who said who said ask not what your country can do for you but what you can do for your country his brother said some things i people see some things as they are and say why i see things that never were and say why not we had martin luther king i had a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We, we had these people and they were feeding us. Today, today, what we have, what have we given our children? We've given them problems that are so huge and complex and deep that they seem insurmountable. Uh, no one seems to know where to begin. An enormous presence without a center or an edge and, and what tools have we given them to work with? A feeling of entitlement, modeling behavior spun from a culture wrapped in self-interest and, and driven by greed. You need not prepare for, earn, wait for, or what you want. Come on down and get what you deserve. So these children need, need to learn to to bring their vision, boil their vision down. They're not going to solve worldwide hunger. They're not going to solve what we're doing to this planet overnight. They, they can't do that. But they can stand up against hate and persecution, learn to do for others, contribute to their community, think of ways to fix things instead of just complaining about them, and stop supporting those who are filling the airways with hate speak. They need to learn to look outside themselves, see what needs to be done, find something that you can get excited about, that something that excites your imagination, learn to do it well and give it back to your community as a gift. You have this marvelous, this marvelous world of electronics, a way to reach out to one another and to speak to one another that we we couldn't even imagine back then and this is this is a tool that is more powerful as they showed in Egypt aside from the bloodshed and the horror of that square the thing that really boggled my mind was that those people who participated in that as as victims put out on the internet a call for all of those involved to come out and clean up the square that was replete with their own blood and they did they took trash bags and cleaned up you're feeling this in your heart aren't you I yes mean, they cleaned up the evidence of what was done to them and they did that on their own, and they did it using, using one of your uh, devices. <laughs> <laughs> why, don't I, why, don't we, why don't we give Samantha's generation the last word? What do you make of all this? What, what's the message here? What's the moral? What's the... 
I think we just can't forget about the Freedom Riders. We can't forget about the history, um, the Civil Rights Movement. We can't forget about where we came from because without these people, we would not be sitting here talking about it, you know? And so I think that people my age have to really take an interest in what happened 50 years earlier, 100 years earlier, and see where we've come and, and look at the things that are going on in the country today and in the world and like she said, find something that you're passionate about that you're really interested about and focus your efforts on that and get p other people involved because one person isn't going to make a difference. Forty students on that Freedom Ride bus, you know, we talked about this, 40 kids, we can't make a difference, but 400, 4,000, 4 million, we can make a difference. So we just need to pull together and realize that, um, you know, we, our, voice, our voices must be heard. Correct me if I'm wrong, but 40 kids on your bus? That's about the same number as we're on your bus. <laughs> Thank you. I've got to end it there. Thank you. Thank you very much Thank for your you. time. Thank you for watching. See you next time.